Welcome to I Need to Know Show, a production of the Public Trust Network. This show was created to inform Americans about the concerns and particular needs of the Puerto Rican community throughout the United States. However, our audience is not Puerto Ricans. Rather, the American public at large, who actually have the power that Puerto Ricans do not have. That is, to decide if Puerto Rico can be treated equally as all Americans under the Constitution. What? You may ask. This is not my opinion. This is what the United States Supreme Court has stated in several court decisions over the years. Many of you have heard of Puerto Rico, but many Americans do not even know where it is. What is sad to note is ever since World War I, Puerto Ricans have fought in every conflict around the world to support this nation and its principles of freedoms enshrined in the Constitution. Puerto Ricans have fought in Korea, Kuwait, Iraq, and around the world so that these people have the right to vote in a democracy of their making for their nation. Yet, Puerto Ricans on the island cannot vote themselves for their president or to have a voting voice in the Congress that sends them to war. In fact, the Supreme Court of the United States has clearly stated that Puerto Rico is governed by what is called the Territorial Clause of the Constitution and is governed by Congress, and Congress controls what rights and privileges apply to Puerto Rico uh, and Puerto Ricans on the island. The Equal Protection Clause, which covers you and me, does not apply to Puerto Ricans on the island. This program is designed to educate Americans on this issue and to create a national platform for stateside Puerto Ricans to discuss this issue and bring it to their senators and congressmen. Puerto Ricans on the island are American citizens, but are not treated like American citizens. We do not advocate for statehood or independence. That is for the citizens of the island to determine. But we Americans do have a voice on how our constitution is applied. Yes. Welcome, everybody, to a I Need to Know radio show. This is a podcast, but I call it a radio show because, of course, I had a radio show for many years. And so I started in my boca de esa manera, all right? So, uh, but but this this show, this podcast is, is part of the uh, uh, Public Trust Network, which is a uh, overall uh, organization that we're trying to establish as a channel that will bring forth to the community information about government, about how government operates, and to try to establish that kind of trust back in the people um, so they understand what's going on. And part of that has been this uh, uh, lead up to uh, the, this uh, national convention, the Puerto Rican Bar Associations, where we will be having lawyers from, from all around the country to talk about the issues that are facing Puerto Rico. For those of us who are new to this channel, you know that we are trying to create a national platform where people could talk about the situation in Puerto Rico. So those of you who don't know, Puerto Rico is a territory. It is not a state. Those people in Puerto Rico are citizens in the United States. However, do not enjoy all the privileges because Puerto Rico itself is a territory governed by the territorial clause and thus uh, they don't have representatives in Congress. So the budget and money they get is a una bendición. <laughs> it's a gift that uh, the, gov the, the, the federal government gives to Puerto Rico because there's no one there really advocating. We have a what we call a non-voting regist uh, um, uh, representative uh, there. Uh, they call a resident commissioner, but he's a she is at this point is a, a voice, but cannot vote. And so the the result is that she can do whatever influence she can to get money for Puerto Rico, but otherwise Puerto Rico does not get the same uh, uh, percentage of the of the budget for education, for transportation, for Medicaid, etc. Uh, simply because that's the the money is not allocated. Uh, to Puerto Rico as the same as citizens in the states. The result in that is that Puerto Rico is hampered. Uh, it's, and because it doesn't have statehood status, it cannot. And because it's not an independent nation, it cannot really cause its own treaties. It, it cannot 
control its borders. It, 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 that is controlled by the sovereign. So all these reasons create a situation that uh, the Puerto Ricans on the island uh, cannot resolve the difficulties of sovereignty. But those Puerto Ricans who are people who identify themselves as Puerto Rican, for example, I myself, uh, my family left Puerto Rico in 1920. Okay, so some una cuanta generaciones ya afuera de Puerto Rico. We have several generations out, but still we consider Puerto Rico a homeland, and we still we are very proud of our heritage, and and see the the situation and want to see what can we do uh, to help Puerto Rico go forth. So um, with that, let me introduce uh, Jose. Uh, and Jose, you were you were born in Puerto Rico and uh, went to law school in Puerto Rico. Is that correct? Yeah, I was born in Sabana Grande, Puerto Rico, a small southwest part of the island town in which I was raised. Uh-huh. And then later I studied in, in the University of Puerto Rico, Maya West, my bachelor's degree, and then in the Pontifical Catholic University, the School of Law. Right. And the Pontifica is in Ponce, is in uh, yes. the southern part of the okay. island. And it's... Uh, so I've been there, and I've actually. Uh, so you know, with uh, in the past, um, when I was president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association of Florida, we did a um, a multi-state uh, moot court competition, where we invited ultimately with over fifteen different law schools from around the country, participated in a moot court competition that dealt with the Fourteenth Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause and how it applies to uh, Puerto Rican citizens. Now, of course, since then, the United States Supreme Court has, in fact, dealt with the issue of sovereignty and clearly stated that Puerto Rico has no sovereignty. There is no dual sovereignty. Puerto Rico is just uh, governed by the territorial clause. So that issue is really quite moot, uh, uh, as we might say. But that doesn't mean that uh, that the, the, the struggle uh, for equality does not continue. So we have to continue with this struggle. And the question is how? How to best resolve? First, resolve this, and uh, this conference that we're about to undertake is is an attempt to try to to get the thinkers, the the professors, the people who write papers, uh, the lawyers who are influencers, in order to um, move the general population. Because the people in Minnesota, they get to vote on whether Puerto Rico is either a state or not, or independent or not. The people in New Hampshire. The nature of Montana and Idaho, they get to vote. So it's not a question that this is only a Puerto Rican problem. We can have a hundred plebiscites in Puerto Rico. It doesn't solve the problem until the people in Montana understand that there is a problem, you know? So to that extent, this is what we're discussing. So I would like to invite you, because you're representing a gentleman that we have invited to be our guest speaker on Thursday night of the, of the event, uh, Kelvin Soto, who is a uh, Puerto Rico, born, born in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican, obviously, of heritage. And he is, I understand, the only Puerto Rican clerk in the entire state of Florida. In fact, I would probably say, the, I don't know if there's another one in the entire United States. So uh, so could you please tell us about, uh, talk to us a little bit about Kelvin and your relationship with him? Well, as I said before, Kelvin, he was a native of Puerto Rico, right? He was born in Puerto Rico. Later, he became a, a Navy uh, officer. He was in a, a Navy, he's a Navy veteran, so he served the, the country, right, on, uh, as a Navy uh, officer. And then he became a businessman and worked in the science field, making research, and as a lawyer, too, as a, a, a very uh, known, well-known lawyer in the area. Uh, and I would say I got into that relationship with him when I first uh, was asked to come for a position in here. And I, I, I find out myself committed to some of the principles and the values that he said that are the things that he wants to put in place as an ambassador, not only of his views or thing, but the people who he represents, right? It, not only Puerto Rican, but the Hispanic community of Central Florida. And he said, hey, I want to I wanna make a pledge with the people that we're going to serve that we care, right? That we're going to make and uh, try to be committed to excellence and uh, that we're going to try to do the things in an efficient way in the court so the people can be committed to the new modernization that the system needs, but also to pathways so they can get a good access in a way that is transparent, that is, uh, you know, that fair and neutral for the people to come to court. 
With that being said, I can just put him as an example of as an ambassador. And that I, I want to join that to your initial introduction in this because he's an ambassador of Puerto Rican people. So if you want to change the mind of the people in the United States, right? The best the best way you can sell a product is to show the product. Right. And and Kelvin is a is, is a product of the principle of values of what of what a, a good professional role model Puerto Rican can do for this country. And okay. with that being said, if we put like what you said in Minnesota or in Florida or different places, people like Kelvin Soto, then you're gonna have people that role model what a Puerto Rican really look like and not what does necessarily the media have been portraying sometimes. And then you can convince people, and then you can persuade people for either purpose mm -hmm. that you want, either to go with certain. I don't. I don't want to go that that way because my in my position, right, we are asking to be neutral and transparent, and you know, having some neutrality and fairness for the people that we talk about. But but yes, we need to be ambassador, and I feel that the Kelvin is a good ambassador for not only for Wickham but that community that we serve. And before he was a clerk, he also was an elected official in the on the school board, if I recall. Um, yes, he spent he quite a bit of time of on school board, so see, yes. he's, he's experienced uh, in the community in the, in the community service, uh, with, uh, particularly with something as important as education, the school. And now he's at the clerks, where he's responsible for making sure that the it's running smoothly, and that is a very important because justice, the you know, perception of justice is as important as actual justice, and so the people have to perceive. That the system is fair. If the people do not believe the system is fair, you will have riots in the street. And that's why we've had situations with the Black Lives Matter, for example, and or January 6th. Either way, people are dissatisfied. They don't feel that the system is working for them. And then they feel frustrated and they may take to the violence. This has been nothing new in our society, but it's always a question of building. And as the Puerto Rican community has uh, uh, come to uh, Florida, uh, remember when I when I got elected to the Florida House of Representatives in 1999, uh, there were not that many Puerto Ricans. Now we have a whole bunch of them, right? But <clears throat> so so this was um, uh, a big migration. Uh, so when Kevin represents that kind of migration, he's at the bulk. And the people want to exert themselves. They want need to feel that they're part of the system, that the system is listening to them. And that's why the clerk actually is so important. I, I, and I want to say, I want to take your words when he was participating in the school uh, in the school board, right? That it's not only that, that you need to take your stand in some places and that, but also that you need to show yourself uh, what is the what what uh, what are Puerto Ricans are made of, right? And and he did. Like when he uh, the other day, I was in a in a customer service uh, training, and the person that was handling the customer service training, uh, he used to be part of that board. As a matter of fact, with different political views than him, and he was telling us, "Hey, when Kelvin was there, why right, he was so interesting on where the money goes in regard to the students, in regard to the people that those funds should be going." That he amazed me in that way. So you see, when you are able to gather that information from people from a different political view than you, that means that you are making a good ambassador role. Yeah, and I think this is extremely important because one of the things that we are trying to stress with this upcoming conference is credibility. Uh, we are going to be very uh, uh, sure, everyone who's participating, that we take no position, partisan position. Politics is one thing we all can discuss politics, but being partisan is a different thing. Now, partisans, for those who are listening, understand that partisan is means I'm with one particular side. I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republic, soy independentista, soy estadista. That's partisan. Politics is a question of our social our society. And so we have to have conversations about our politics without having to be partisan. That's okay. But if if we and I think the, those of us who have have the experience, who are lawyers, who are professors, who are writing, who are writing about the problem, we must be get together. We must establish a platform that is credible, as you just said, an example, a role model. 
This has to be credible so that the people out there in Minnesota, Wyoming, and Idaho, they say, wow, that's a Puerto Rican. He sounds like an American. Yeah, that's because we are. Okay. And so so the, we have to create that, that role model and we have to have the creativity. And then uh, we have to pass it along. And I think the, uh, my next interview, is, I'm going to interview the next generation, um, which is, you know, how do they feel about it? Because it's one thing. Uh, you were born on the island. Kevin was born on the island. It's natural to have an affinity to the island, even if you're living in, in Florida. But then there are Puerto Ricans like myself who are second and third generation Puerto Rican, and it gets more distant, the, the problem of Puerto Rico. And if we don't keep this alive, right, if we don't keep the problem or the situation alive, it just keeps, you know, the, the three million Puerto Ricans, there's a tempest in a teapot. And it, it, it doesn't get resolved unless those of us who have an affinity to the island keep it alive. And the question then will be how? How do we do that? How do we keep this interest alive so that, um, as, as Joe Biden uh, was saying, my goodness, uh, we went to Vietnam and we had dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we dropped on, on, on uh, Europe and or Japan during World War II. Yet, we were able to go, he was able to go to Vietnam, sign a treaty with Vietnam, forget the past and move forward with a new relationship. And we, for those of us who do not know, Puerto Rico became an American territory. It wasn't like they volunteered, you know. <laughs> United States Marine Corps invaded Puerto Rico and decided this is an interesting place to stay. You know, um, and so it's part of the Spanish-American War, 1898. Um, we took over, no, no invaded only Puerto Rico, of course, invaded Cuba and the Philippines and other places. But, and those other places were left free. But Puerto Rico said, and the Americans said, Puerto Rico, this is an interesting little morsel here. I think that we might be able to keep this one, all right? And they have. Now, it doesn't mean that's bad. We've had all sorts of things we've done in our nation. Uh, we've done good things and we've done some bad things. So invading a country is not necessarily a good thing. But the relationship we've had with the United States, in my opinion, of course, I also served in the military. I was a captain in the United States Army. I was in the military intelligence corps. I consider myself very American, very loyal, but I also consider myself Puerto Rican. And, but I know that in 1898, at that time, when the United States was exerting itself with its manifest destiny, it was exerting itself like all other nations of the world. And you know, Europe was out there in Africa, and, and, and South, uh, Southeast Asia trying to dominate, um, creating colonies all around the world. This was what big powers did. So the United States did that because everybody else was doing that who were big powers. But that doesn't mean it has to stay that way. It doesn't mean that that was the correct today. So we have to change. The question is when and how. So, so in, this in is the the how some things I have seen, especially from uh, Kelvin right in here. Again, let, let me just put it this way because maybe you're looking for examples that can show how, right? Like right. if you talk to my grandparents, maybe they're gonna talk to, to you about the El Jibaro Puerto Rican, right? That right. figure of that person with such a humbleness and just a kindness and hospitality for the people around him or the visitors that come that show those principles. But guess what, right? In here, that's basically the principle that Kelvin have been trying to input in the in the judicial system in here. When he say, hey, we want to serve the people we care. People, they don't come to the court to celebrate. People come right. to the court because they need to solve a situation. So they, you can truly understand that they're going to come escalated, right. that they're going to come with situation, that they're going to look for a remedy, and, and maybe we're at the last resource to help with all. So he said, hey, we need to go above and beyond and always help each individual and treating them with compassion and respect. And he has been embedding them in all the stuff in here in, in yep. such a way that we, okay, we're going there. We're doing that in such a way that you can get the response now from the people that they say, yes, they have a customer care clerk there, not only that they are knowledgeable in what they're doing, but they also treat us with respect and care. And that's part of what he's been embedding in his administration with his policies in here. And, yep. and that's a good thing. And, to and I want to thank you, because this is it. 
Yep, absolutely. It's that. That's. It's like you said. Use the word role model. I like. I like to I use that word as well and say that we have to be. Uh, we have to set forth a serious discussion with role models that, that the, the rest of America can look at. Uh, we will be taping all the classes, all the, by the way, so you know, uh, we have eight classes that we're offering as continuing education uh, during the course of which I think it's an 11 and a half credits that the Florida Bar uh, has certified as CLE credits for Florida lawyers. So, so this is a this is a serious, uh, serious conference, you know, and we will hope to be able to project that kind of seriousness. And we are, we are welcome uh, the the clerk of our Osceola the County, Mr. the Honorable Kelvin Soto, to join us that day. I'm looking forward to seeing. It. Hopefully, you'll be able to make it. Okay, and get your ticket before it's too late. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, and it's it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting. I'm sure that you will learn something. Plus. Of course, as a Florida lawyer, you could also get the CLE credits as well. So I want to thank you very much for joining us. Jose, is there anything you'd like to, to add to this conversation? Well, first first of all, I want to let the people, your audience know that Osceola County is having somebody in the clerk of the court that is willing to serve them. And we all do, all together as a team. He, he strives for team work with all of us. He don't treat us as just the mere employees that I handle or I lead but as a teamwork. And one of the things that we have been doing is driving efficiencies. What, what I mean is that if you are in Puerto Rico and you need our service here, right? You can feel free to contact us and we're gonna try to work with you with some service for documentation they need. Or there's some Puerto Ricans that comes in here that need documentation of things that will impact their life in Puerto Rico, like power of attorneys, the things that need the apostille, things that need, and he is making us that cultural awareness understanding that we need to serve the people we care, that we need to make a transformative leadership in here in a way that, again, I'm going to emphasize that we are ambassadors of what we want the people to think about Puerto Ricans or any culture that we represent, but also that we are serving the people we care. So that's that's something that made me happy of working here. That's terrific. I, I want to tell everybody, if you uh, like this interview and you like this content, you can go to the Public Trust Network on uh, YouTube and see the other interviews of the other guests that we've had in the past. And we will continue this project through the year until next year when we, we, we reconvene in 2024. I expect to have a major, uh, major event developed by that time so that we can have presidential candidates showing up. What do you think of that? Yeah. And I, and I want to invite all the community and all your audience too to come to the court, not only because they have something to deal in the court, but they can come in here. For example, he created the Nest Gallery, a place in which he's giving students from high school an opportunity to display their art in our gallery halls in the, in, in, in the court. Also, they can come in here for different things. They're going to be doing like group weddings, like they do the uh, Halloween wedding, the Valentine's Day wedding, the patriotic wedding. You see, it's a way to embed that cultural responsive awareness, even though you're working as a county controller or as a uh, clerk of the court. Well, thank you, Jose Rivera, presidente uh, uh, de Kelvin, clerk, Kelvin Soto, el clerk de Osceola County. Gracias por estar con nosotros en este día. Thank you. Thank you for all you do for our community, too.